Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Kate. I'm a health coach and I post videos on a high fat, nutrient dense way of eating. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Feel free to share and make sure to subscribe. And make sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook where I share new posts every single day. All right, so welcome back to the channel guys. Today I am going to be doing another q and A. I I asked you if you had any questions in my Facebook group and on my community tab, and you guys actually left some really good ones, so I'm excited to get into them. Now I find when I do q and A's, <laughs> I kind of ramble on and spend a lot of time answering each question. I'm going to try to go through the questions today sort of rapid fire and not spend too much time rambling on each one, but we'll see how that goes. That might just end up happening, and if so, it is what it is, but I do want to try to answer as many as I possibly can. So with that being said, let's just get straight into it. Vanessa asked, have you noticed that those who eliminate dairy completely can help their health problems faster because of less inflammation? Now, dairy is one of those things that it's kind of on a spectrum. Obviously, a lot of people are intolerant to dairy and to cow dairy specifically. Now, in terms of inflammation, it depends on the individual. There are some people who tolerate dairy completely fine, and for them, it does not cause any inflammation. And then there are other people who it is very inflammatory for, and when they consume it, they have difficulty losing weight, they have more inflammation in their joints and things like that. So it really depends on the individual in terms of inflammation. Now, with that being said, <laughs> I do think it can be counterintuitive for weight loss it is one food that is considered to be keto, considered to be carnivore, that is easy to overconsume for some people. Whereas most foods, when you're eating a keto or carnivore diet, are difficult to overconsume. Things like steak, things like chicken, it's hard to eat a large quantity past your energy needs. Whereas with cheese and with dairy, it is a lot easier to sort of like binge on those foods, if you will. So in that sense, I think for some people, if you have a hard time, <laughs> I guess, moderating it, oh, I hate the word moderation, but if you can tell that you're over consuming it, then it might be causing you problems in terms of weight loss. But in terms of inflammation, it just depends on the individual. Crystal asked, if you want to eat out occasionally, how do you do so healthily? Okay, so there are a couple different approaches when it comes to eating out that you can take. I think if you're trying to stay keto, it's pretty easy to eat out at most places. What you need to focus on is getting in protein and then getting non-starchy vegetables. So that can look like a steak and a side of veggies. That can look like salmon and veggies. When you look at it that way, it becomes a lot easier to figure out what you can have when you're eating out. A lot of meat dishes will often come with a side of potatoes, but you can usually ask those to be swapped for something else, steamed vegetables, whatnot. So if you're trying to eat healthily when eating out, then that would be what I recommend. Protein, fat, vegetables, stick with that. Now, in terms of fast food, there are certain places that are better than others. My go-to is always to get a burrito bowl from Zambrero's. I know they don't cook in the best oil, but it's a once in a while thing, so I'm not too stressed out about it. I just get no rice, no beans, extra protein, add avocado, add cheese, sour cream, all that. Very healthy meal, aside from the oils it's cooked in, but that aside, everything else is good, low carb, keto. That's my go-to for fast food. I know a lot of people will just get burger patties as well when they're eating out. Oh, or there's just like a lot of places that are doing bunless burgers now and doing like a lettuce wrap instead. That's also a healthier option than eating traditional fast food. So those would be my tips for eating out. Now, I know that it isn't possible in all situations. For example, if you're going for like a dim sum lunch or something where everything is breaded, <laughs> or just in dough and dumpling wrappers, etc. Yeah, it's a bit more difficult to eat low carb. In situations like that, I kind of just give myself 
like a bit of leniency and sort of like a cheat meal, if you will. I don't really um, plan cheat meals or cheat days, things like that. I just sort of let them happen. Like if the situation, it's gonna be too difficult for me to eat healthy and eat my normal low carb whole food diet, then yeah, I cut myself some slack because in the grand scheme of things, stressing out over that one meal, the stress is going to do you more harm than eating off plan for one meal is going to. And if eating off plan is also gonna help you to enjoy sort of like the social setting you're in, that's another bonus as well. So yeah, there's a couple different strategies. As much as I can, I try to eat healthy when I'm eating out, but I know that when I eat at home, I'm eating <laughs> as healthy as possible. So I don't stress too much when I'm eating out. Kathy asked, is butter inflammatory like other dairy? Now we kind of touched on this before, but I didn't mention this part that I'm about to. Butter and ghee especially are less inflammatory than like milk is for example, because, and cheese as well, sorry. Butter, cheese, and ghee, they all have the lactose and casein removed. This gets removed during the fermentation process. So this is usually the parts of dairy that are inflammatory for people are the lactose and the casein. Hard aged cheeses are going to have the lowest amounts of this and soft fresh cheeses will still have some lactose and casein. And the same goes for butter and ghee. Butter has like just trace amounts of it, but ghee has even less, as close as possible to zero. So if you are sensitive to dairy, cheese, butter, and ghee might be okay for you. Just depends how sensitive you are. But yeah, that is one interesting thing that I thought I would mention. Tyran, Tyranus, Tyranus, I've never seen, oh, that's probably not a name since his last name is apparently Zombie. I was, here I was feeling bad for not pronouncing it properly. Anyways, however you say it, sorry about that. <laughs> he asked, how would someone go about lowering their cholesterol in a healthy manner and what foods would trigger it to go high? Now, I have a few videos on cholesterol. I actually just filmed one last week that will be going live after this one. But I think the way we look at cholesterol is all wrong. <laughs> Doctors will focus on total cholesterol and on LDL. And if either of these are high, then alarm bells go off. But LDL and total cholesterol aren't even good indicators of heart disease risk. Better indicators are your HDL and your triglycerides. And if these numbers are good, but your LDL is a bit high, it's a good sign. Like you shouldn't just focus on LDL and we shouldn't be focused about lowering our cholesterol. We should be focused on lowering our triglycerides and increasing HDL. Because if we have high HDL and lower triglycerides, this is a good indicator of heart health and of overall health and also of insulin sensitivity because all of these things go hand in hand. If you have high triglycerides and low HDL, this is a sign you're insulin resistant and you are at a higher risk of heart disease. And this is a stronger indicator than looking at LDL alone. There have also been studies where LDL has been lowered artificially using drugs and other methods. And I'm thinking of one study in particular that I just talked about in the video I just filmed. Those who had their LDL lowered after, I can't remember how many years it was, five, 10 years maybe, the people who took this drug and lowered their LDL had higher mortality than those who had higher LDL and didn't do anything to change it. So yeah, looking at LDL alone shouldn't be your focus. Focus on lowering your triglycerides and increasing your HDL. And I actually have videos on both of those topics, so I will link those up above, check them out, but yeah. The way we look at cholesterol is totally wrong. It's hurting our health more than helping it because all these metrics of health, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL, they all go hand in hand and they all link back to insulin resistance. All of these are indicators that your heart disease risk is higher and whatnot. And Focusing on one of these metrics and trying to address it on its own, taking a blood pressure lowering medication, taking a blood sugar lowering medication, taking a cholesterol lowering medication, it's not addressing the root cause. Like honestly, it is crazy how much comes back to insulin resistance. And when you address that and work towards reversing that, 
your blood pressure comes down, your blood sugar comes down, your cholesterol, even your LDL will come down. It still might be a bit higher than what is considered normal, but it does come down from like sky high levels for most people. Yeah, I think it's just, <laughs> Treating symptoms is not the answer. It is a short-term fix and it doesn't improve your health. <laughs> I just have to say, so I'm having jaw surgery in two days and <laughs> I had these hooks put on my braces on last Thursday, today's Tuesday, and oh my God, they are just absolutely cutting up and mangling the insides <laughs> of my lips. And when I talk a lot, like I do when I'm filming a video like this and my other videos, it's just even worse. So we're struggling a little bit here just to talk, but in two days I won't be able to talk at all. So then I'll be complaining about that or I'll be complaining in my head because I will not be able to say anything. Anyways, just wanted to put that out there. Just complain while I can. Oh, the other reason I was just saying that is because it's kind of impacting my speech. I tried to film a whole bunch of videos last Friday, so I got these on on Thursday and then I was filming on Friday, and certain words I just could not say. I was like repeating my line time and time again, and I just could not get it, and I was getting so frustrated. And so if I sound kind of funny in this video and I'm saying anything that, I don't know, just sounds off, that's what I'm blaming it on. <laughs> But anyways, let's keep going. Okay, I had a couple questions like this. Someone asked if I was single, and then someone asked, do you think your diet and lifestyle would affect how you choose a potential romantic partner? So these are a bit more <laughs> personal than most of them. Okay, you guys who have been around my channel for a while, OG subscribers, you'll know that I was in a relationship for a long time, and if you are a real true subscriber or not true subscriber but like just just like a real one um you will follow my vlog channel as well and earlier this year i posted a breakup video which is so cringy to think about honestly <laughs> oh like i can't believe i posted that Ooh, i was in a weird place but yes so i think that answers the single question because that is still the current situation Despite doing some dating, no one has stood out so far. Um, the second question was, do you think your diet and lifestyle would affect how you choose a potential romantic partner? I definitely think it does a bit because it's so difficult. A lot of people don't think about their diet at all and will just eat whatever and will eat out all the time. And that's not really what I'm about. Uh, like, obviously, <laughs> you guys know that. So I think that does affect it a bit. Like obviously I'm not only going to date someone who's keto or carnivore who understands all of this and is in the space and whatnot, but like someone who has a general understanding of health and yeah, just likes to take care of their health and um, prioritize nutrition when they can. I think that is a good thing. <laughs> I don't know, this is awkward to talk about. I don't know. Nah. Anyways, yes, I do think it does play a role, but it's not everything would be my answer to that one. John asked, I eat healthy, but I eat way too much. Any suggestion to stop overeating? Now, I think the biggest thing you can do to stop overeating is to prioritize your protein first. So make sure that you're getting enough in at each meal, at least 30 grams, depending on how many meals you're eating in a day and your current body weight, how tall you are, how much muscle mass you have. Obviously, if you have more muscle, you're gonna eat more protein to maintain that. But really making sure you're getting enough protein in can help you to not overeat on fat, carbs, anything else you're eating. So that would be my suggestion. Just make sure that you are definitely getting enough protein. Beyond that, just the sort of cliche, be mindful when you're eating, really listen to your hunger cues. Don't eat quickly. Don't eat while you're watching TV and whatnot. Don't eat sort of impulsively, just reaching for a snack, that sort of thing. Really think about, am I hungry or am I just bored? Am I doing this to avoid doing something else? Is this just procrastination? I am the queen of procrastination eating. When I am like sitting at home just on my laptop and 
I'm trying to get work done, <laughs> I will be like, oh yeah, I'm hungry. And I'll like kind of go back and forth between the fridge and I'm like, no, I'm not hungry. I'm just avoiding what I actually need to be doing. So just kind of making that connection between why you are having cravings or why you are having the urge to eat. And if you are actually hungry, that can make a big difference. All right, I think I'm going to go over to, oh, there's still so many questions here. I'm not going very fast. I've been filming for like 20 minutes. Yeah, I'm gonna go over to my Facebook group and read some of the questions there. If you guys aren't a member of my Facebook group, it's just called Health Coach Kate Community um, on Facebook, obviously. And I do some posts there. People ask questions. We have some good conversations going on sometimes. So join that if you would like. Okay, another personal one here. Fee asked, you had such a tough year last year and I've been wondering how things are going now. You seem in a much better place. <laughs> um, honestly, last year, 2020, was not a bad year for me. In Australia, it was pretty chill with COVID. We kind of had everything under control. So while everything was exploding overseas, uh, yeah, things were pretty normal here. But this year, <laughs> in terms of my personal life, uh, like I don't even know. I've just had, I was gonna say bad luck, not bad luck. I've just had a lot of challenges and big changes thrown my way. As I briefly mentioned before, I went through a breakup earlier in the year. That was the end of a seven year relationship. That was the reason that I moved to Australia initially. So that was really tough because I went from living with someone, being with someone for seven years to being on my own in a foreign country with my whole family on the opposite side of the world in the middle of a pandemic. So that was a bit of a trip. Some of you guys have been asking me as well if I still live in Australia because obviously I'm from Canada, if you can't tell from the accent. Yes, I still live in Australia. I actually bought a house here a few months ago. This beautiful house <laughs> that I am now sitting in. So that was obviously a big change and that was actually really stressful as well, getting the mortgage sorted and stuff and moving out of my old place, they give me a tough time and like I'm not here to complain. I'm really not here to complain because I know how fortunate I am. I know I have a lot of good things going for me, but honestly, like if I could tell you half of the stuff that happened to me, <laughs> even up until September, <laughs> like even my therapist, the like a couple of therapists, I have actually every single therapist I've went to, I've went to a few different ones now. They've all been like shocked when I tell them, what my year has been like. So that's saying something. <laughs> Anyways, all for a reason, right? Now I'm a stronger person because of it. That's what I keep telling myself and I truly believe that. So yeah, this year has been really tough. Last year was not so, so bad. Um, but the last couple months especially have been trending in the right direction. Obviously I just said I bought this house. The process up to that was stressful, but buying it's been great and living here, moving in, kind of finding my independence. I mean, like I've, uh, I'm, I'm an independent person, but just really being forced to make big life decisions and know that I really have no one else to fall back on. It is just me. I am now responsible for this mortgage, me and me alone. <laughs> That's been overwhelming a little bit, but also like really a learning experience, a growing experience. <laughs> yeah, I, what was the original question? Yes, I'm, I'm doing better now. That was the question. And I mean, just making the most of it and trying to figure things out and yeah, just do what I can. Knock on wood though, things are going my way <laughs> right now. We'll see how my surgery goes. But thank you so much for asking, Fee. That's really nice of you. Fuji asked, quickest way to reduce a fasting insulin number? Zero carb, but high protein or high fat? Now, in terms of reducing insulin, while well, obviously eating nothing, intermittent fasting is going to be the most effective. But beyond that, yes, eating low carbs and Either high protein, high fat, or a mix of the two is going to be effective. Now, I know there's some, a bit of a misunderstanding when it comes to protein. It can have a significant effect on insulin levels depending on 
what the rest of your diet looks like and whether you're burning mainly fat or burning mainly carbohydrates. If you are eating a high carb diet and you pair protein with carbs, then your insulin response is much higher than if you were to eat carbs or protein alone. However, if you eat a low carb diet and you eat protein, there is next to no insulin response. So yeah, as long as you're eating low carbs, then eat enough protein for your needs and then add some fat. That's probably the best way to lower your insulin quickly. Claudia asked, a couple questions here. What is the best foods to eat after a workout and how long should one wait to eat after a workout? Okay, so when you're working out, it doesn't really matter what you eat after the workout, just as long as you're getting enough protein in, in that day, whether it's before or after, this is important for building your muscles. In terms of how long you should wait to eat afterwards, depends on your goals. If your goals are fat loss, then you might wanna wait a little bit longer just to get a little bit more of the fat burning after effects. But other than that, there's no hard rule, just kinda like whenever you're hungry after you eat and just make sure you get enough protein in throughout the day. She also asked, Migraines, top reasons why people get migraines. I told someone that it could be allergies or food sensitivities, but what else could lead to migraines? Okay, um, electrolyte deficiencies, sodium, potassium, and magnesium specifically. These can all cause migraines. That's probably one of the number one causes. I think just a lot of people, magnesium, like I said specifically, are not getting enough, and this can be a trigger for migraines. So. There's actually a company called, what are they called? Magteen, sorry. <laughs> they have a magnesium supplement specifically for like cognitive health and for migraines. I will link that in the description box down below and I do have a promo code for 10% off, that's Kate10. So I recommend that to everyone who is having migraines and thinks they might not be getting enough magnesium. Um, things such as like a gluten sensitivity that can also cause migraines as well. Yeah, you already said sensitivities to other foods. So just figuring out what your triggers are, what foods you're eating when you have the migraines, that can really help to narrow it down and figure out what's going on for you specifically. Okay, another personal question. Might as well just answer all these. Oh, I kind of answered this before. Justine asked, I might be out of the loop, but had you considered moving back to Canada before you bought your home in Australia? So honestly, it didn't really I mean, it crossed my mind. I was like, well, what do I do now that me and my ex-partner broke up? Do I just go back to Canada? There was just a lot of, like I have a lot of things sort of tying me down here. Not tying me down, like I could make it work. My cats being one of them, they're obviously here. I wouldn't want to put them on like a 24 hour, like three plane flight to get back to Canada. Um, I don't know how well they would do with that. They'd, they'd be fine, but like, that's just a big roadblock. My business is set up here. Everything is registered and trademarked and et cetera in Australia. And I really, really like Australia and Adelaide and the Adelaide Hills specifically. I just think it is so nice living here. I cannot stress that enough. Like going back to Toronto, like I like Toronto, don't get me wrong. But in terms of quality of life, I absolutely love the Adelaide Hills and Adelaide. Weather's better, number one. There's just a lot that I really, really like about it here. And yeah, I didn't, like it crossed my mind, but then I was like, no, like this is my home now and also pandemic, <laughs> I was like, well, there's no chance I can go home right now, even if I wanted to. It would have been nice to go back for a visit at least and just be with my family and my friends there, but it wasn't an option at the time. So no, end, end goal is to buy a place in Toronto and spend a couple months there every year. Not there just yet. <laughs> if you're from Toronto or from Canada, you probably know that the housing prices there are like insane, insane. So <laughs> that's the goal at one point, but oh, I just have to keep working to get there. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really see myself moving back there permanently. That's, that's my answer. <laughs> All right, I think I'll wrap this video up here. I think we had a good range of sort of personal questions and also nutrition questions. 
I always feel so weird answering personal questions because I'm like, no one wants to hear about me. No one really cares about, oh my God. Well, I don't want to say no one cares about me because I know you guys do care about me. I honestly, you guys are like the best subscribers ever. When people talk about how difficult it is being on YouTube and like mean comments and whatnot, yeah, I get that, but the vast, vast majority is so positive and you guys are just so, so kind. I cannot believe it. So I don't want to say that you guys don't care about me, but I mean, I'm, I'm not someone who really likes talking about myself and really likes opening up, but I like watching YouTubers do that. So I figure you guys might like that as well. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I keep saying I'll do monthly Q&As and I think I've done one like every other month. I think I did July, September, November. I'm not gonna say now that I'm gonna do monthly ones because I won't be doing much talking in November, uh, in December, sorry. Uh, so maybe I'll do it in January and try to pick up with monthly ones again then. But yeah, I always try to answer as many questions as I can in the comment section of my videos, especially within the first couple hours, as much as I can. Like sometimes there's questions that are really complex or just like way out of my scope of practice that I cannot address. So those ones I might not get back to, but I try to get back to as many as I can. And also in my Facebook group that I obviously mentioned earlier, Lots of people ask questions there, same thing. I try to answer as many as I can or else my assistant coach, Alicia, she's really great at answering questions there. And there are so many knowledgeable people in that group as well who are always ready to chime in and help you out. So if you need any more support, definitely join that group. If you want even more support, you can join my coaching programs, which are a bit more personal. I have a keto one and a carnivore one and those are private Facebook groups as well that are a lot smaller and any questions you have, myself or Alicia answers within 24 hours. So those are good. We have like a really nice tight knit community in those groups. But anyways, I am going to wrap this video up here. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this wasn't boring and I hope I didn't ramble on too long. I think I've been filming for like 40 minutes though. So <laughs> in editing, this is gonna have to be a bit condensed and yeah, I hope it wasn't <laughs> too boring and you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy this video, remember to give it a thumbs up and click that subscribe button if you're not already. This is a more casual video, but I usually put out two sort of informational videos every single week about nutrition, nutrition mainly, but also sleep, lifestyle things, light, whatnot, everything revolving around health. If you did enjoy this video, you might also enjoy, what video should I recommend to you guys today? Ooh, my video on apple cider vinegar and weight loss. I actually just made that video go live today and it's been getting a lot of views and a lot of positive feedback. So you guys might enjoy that. I will link it here. If you wanna catch up on my most recent upload, you can click here. And if you wanna check out my keto diet and carnivore diet coaching programs that I mentioned earlier, you can click here. Thanks guys, I'll see you next time. Bye.